book of Revelation, chapter number 1. Gentiles 
in, in this time era. So, John saw a mystery. The church is a mystery. The mystery that John saw was like this. It was seven stars and seven golden candlesticks. And, uh, and, and, uh, and they were, it was all it tells us in the Savior's right hand. Those things which you saw that were in my right hand, he says. And at the end of verse 20, the Lord gives the meaning of, these, of this mystery. The stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the candlesticks are the seven churches. That's what it says. And then he goes straight from there into chapters 2 and chapter 3. And he writes to the Lord's churches, Jesus' words to those churches. In fact, the words are in red. Jesus said, write this, and it's his message to these churches. Before we leave chapter 1 and start off into chapter 2 and chapter 3, uh, looking at these individual local churches, I want to point out some things all of these churches have in common. First of all, I would propose to you that all of these churches, the seven churches he's writing to, that are representative of, of all of the churches today, that all of these churches had a pastor. Unto the, seven star, uh, the, the, unto the seven stars, which are the angels, he says, the angels of the seven churches, unto the angel at the church at Ephesus, unto the angel at the church at Pergamos. I do not believe, and I've stated this several times throughout the years, I want to reiterate, and if you don't agree with this, that's okay, but I do not believe these angels that he was writing to, these messengers were... A, some type of a celestial being, but the word angel in its most basic form just simply means a messenger, and I believe, I personally believe, that when John was writing these letters to the churches, he was sending a letter to the pastor of each of these church, churches. Now that may not be your interpretation, and that's fine, but uh, that's what I believe. He, the, the pastor is a messenger of God. Sometimes you're going to like what he says. Sometimes you're not going to like what he says. It's just the way it is. But something about the pastor, as we get out of these last two verses now, I want you to think about this. He is held in God's right hand. If, this, if, if these seven stars or these... Seven angels are held in the in the in the hand of God. If that's if these are the pastors, that means the pastor is held in God's hand. And I say something to you right here. God's hand is a place of protection, and I'm going to tell you this. This isn't rebuke from me to you. This is just something that needs to be said in the church. If, if God is holding his pastors in his hand, you better be real careful how you treat the man of God. Now you better be real careful. Does that mean that he is above reproach? Absolutely not. You need to be real careful how you reproach him. Does that mean that he's above criticism? Absolutely not. But you need to be real careful about how you criticize him. Does that mean that you're not ever supposed to get mad at the pastor? Absolutely not. You're free to get mad. You better be real careful how you do that and how you handle that. Uh, you're, you can get in a lot of trouble with God messing with God's man. And well, preach, you just saying that because you are. Well, let me tell you something. I believed that a long time before I surrendered to preach. I've been believing that ever since I've been trusting Christ as my Savior. And so, uh, so I just want to say that they all had a pastor. Number two, they all had a local assembly. These were seven churches, seven cities, seven towns. They were all local. Uh, and, and it just uh, it perturbs me a little bit. Those that will take these letters to these seven churches and say, well, this is representative of the universal church. How do you get that? It was seven letters to seven churches in seven different towns. They were local. 
New Testament churches, representative of the local New Testament visible church in our day. They also, oh, let me, let me back up and say this. They had a local assembly. These were where people, these were places where the people of God were meeting. They were assembling together. That's what Ecclesia is. It's a called out body of believers that assemble in a physical assembly. Uh, whenever it says the seven churches, it's not talking about seven different buildings. Uh, the church is not the building. The church is the people. And I don't even know if they had a building. I'm sure they did of some sort. But that doesn't mean that there is a church meeting there. I, there there's, a, there's buildings all over our countryside and all over the, the, the United States. Great big buildings. Somebody's paying the upkeep on them. But uh, you go over there on Sunday night and there's nobody there. And you go over there on Wednesday nights and there's nobody there. They're not assembling. Well, a building don't make the church. A building doesn't make an assembly. That old boy that bought the that bought the old railroad church over here by the cemetery, he's put a pile of money into it. The building looks nice, the concrete works looks nice, but I've yet to see them have a church service over there. Well, that's not a church. That's a building. You understand the difference? It makes a it makes a big difference. These these people had a local assembly. Not just a website, not just a building, not just a YouTube channel, but they met in person under the preaching of the Word of God, and, uh, and, and they were a local assembly. This local assembly was also held in God's hand. He said, those stars that I held in my right hand and those, those candlesticks that I hold in my hand. The church, the local New Testament, dare I say Baptist church, is also a place of protection. I believe there is special protection just being a baptized member of the local Baptist church. I do. I, I think it's a whole lot safer for you to be a member than for you to be saved and not be a member. It, it's good to be in the church. It's good to, to be fitly joined and planted into a local body of believers the way God intended for you to be. This is a place where people are going to pray for you. That's protection. This is a place where people are going to care about you. That's protection. This is a place where you're going to hear a routine and sound doctrine preaching of the Word. That's protection. There's, there's protection of being a member of the Lord's church. And they also, the church also has a responsibility. The pastor has a responsibility of being the messenger. The church also has a responsibility. As we move into these letters to the seven churches, you find where he talks about, I know thy works. They have responsibilities, and the responsibility of carrying out the Great Commission, the responsibility of praise and worship, you do realize that's not optional. That's not when you feel like it. That's not something that you can take or leave. But we are called to uh, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. We are called to praise and worship God in the house of God. It is a responsibility. The responsibility of financing the house of God. The tithes and offerings is what I'm talking about right there. And, uh, and so all of these works, the responsibility to sound doctrine, and, uh, and all of these works are the responsibility of the church. They had a pastor. He was held in God's hand. He was God's messenger. They had local assemblies. Each one of these churches are held in God's hand. And they have a responsibility. So we move on to chapter number 2. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move quick. I went over time. I'm going to redeem some time this afternoon. Besides that, I think my voice is about to play out anyway. Chapter number 2. And I'm going to read verses 1 through 7. We're going to look at the church at Ephesus for just a minute. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and hast tried them which are say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, uh, and, and 
for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and I will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. You all understand the implications of that right there. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, and, uh, and uh, which I also hate, and he that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. A few things I want you to notice out of this letter to the church at Ephesus now. This isn't the last time we'll be looking at this letter, but just a few things I want you to notice. First of all, I want you to notice the omniscience of God. Verse number two, I know thy works. By the way, that means the evil and the good. I know thy works. You understand the angel, whoever that is, I believe it's the pastor, he may not know it. He may not see it. But God says, I know thy works. Is that not the way it is in the church today? The pastor may not know. The people may not know. Other churches may not know the works of Highland, good or evil. But God says, I know thy works. God knows all about the sin, and, and we could talk a while about that, but I want to move to the positive side of this thing. God also knows things that are done for His name's sake that go unnoticed. Think about this. God knows about the labor. He said, I know thy works and thy labor. The labor, the work that was going on in this church, all of the labor, the housekeeping, the cooking and the cleaning, these things that seem to go unnoticed. What about the hours of preparation of uh, Sunday school classes and Sunday school teachers, especially uh, th those that teach the little, the little bitty kids? And my wife can spend hours in her Sunday school room preparing for to teach little bitty kids. I'm thinking just give them a ball of Play-Doh. They don't care if there's a dead skunk on the table. But the Lord knows that He sees all of that. Uh, he sees the hours of preparation. What about this one? He knows the labor of prayers. A lot of times when people don't know who's, you don't know who's praying for you. The hours and the, and the time and the prayers that have been lifted up on your hat. Behalf. You may not see it. People may not see it from our church, but God knows about these things. God knows about the patience. He said, I know thy labor and thy patience. God knows all about the times that you wanted to tear into somebody and you didn't. And you knew they needed it, but you didn't. And he also knows all about the times that you've been waiting on an answer for a prayer that you've been praying for a long time. God knows about that. God knows all about the moral stand that takes place in the church and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. That doesn't give us a license to kick visitors out of the church. Somebody say amen. Uh, we're not out there. We're not the sin sheriff. We're not, we're not trying to police the church for uh, visitors who may have some sin in their life. But listen, this is talking about those who have taken a stand against God's word and a stand against God's, uh, God's message and His gospel. And he says, listen, I know when you've taken a moral stand in your church. There's been a, a just using our own church as the example here, our church has, uh, has preached messages and addressed issues 
here in this place that others needed to hear and they weren't here to hear it. They needed to. They needed to know where we stand on the sins of homosexuality. They needed to know where we stand on the sin of, 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 of premarital sex. They needed to know where we stand on the sin of... of, of, of I'm just going to get off of that. But listen. Yeah. Listen. God knows about it. He knows where we stood on these issues. God knows about the discernment. How thou, he said, he said it here in the middle of verse 2, and how thou hast tried them which are, say they are apostles and are not, and have found them to be liars. God knows about the discernment within his church. He knows about the 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 uh, the, the, the church and that they won't just call any preacher just because they need a preacher. He knows about that church that won't just use any Bible just because. It's sitting on the shelf at Lifeway, or won't just teach out of any book just because it's sitting on the shelf at the bookstore, but has some discernment about who is the man of God, who is the right man of God for this church, what is the right Bible, what is the right doctrine, what is the right kind of church. Discernment. God knows all about that. God knows about the determination in His churches. Verse 2 is not tried them which are uh, in verse 3 and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake that, that labored and has not fainted. The determination God knows about it, the world will never know all of the times that the devil has tried to destroy God's churches, that the devil has tried to steal God's church and God's people away from this world and, and just to find out that the people of God are going to stand strong in the faith, they're going to keep working and they're going to keep pressing on through all of the hardships. The world may not know about that, but God does. God does. The omniscience of God. I know that works. Verses 4 and 5, I want you to notice this, the rebuke of God. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love, remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent. Sometimes, even though God knows of the discernment used in His church and the labor and the patience and the, 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 the moral stand and the determination, even though God knows all about that, Sometimes sin rises up in the church and God needs to tan our hides. Would you agree with that? Yes. By the way, this message of rebuke comes through the angel. Through the messenger. The letter was written and given to the angel and the angel is the one that gave it to the church. Well, if that's the pastor, let me say it like this. Sometimes... Sometimes the preacher gives a message that people don't want to hear. Sometimes it ruffles feathers. And let me say this too. Sometimes it's because the preacher misspeaks. He's not above doing that. That's why we have to hold everything the preacher says up to the line of God's Word to get the, get the truth, to get the purity of it. Because the man of God is just flesh and he can, he can misspeak. Sometimes people get their feathers ruffled because the preacher said something he shouldn't have said. That's a possibility. It happens. But sometimes it is the preacher says exactly what you needed to hear and you just didn't want to hear it. It, 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 it's the rebuke of God. It comes through the messenger. Your problem's not with the preacher sometimes. It's the, it, it's the message. It's your problem is with God. You don't want to hear what He has to say about the sin in your life. God's rebuke is meant to prick the heart. He says, Thou hast left thy first love. Man, can, I mean, that's like, that's like your mama telling you, Well, you just don't love me. Uh, that, that's to get at the heart. You understand, whatever we're doing that is wrong is contrary to the love that we have for our Savior. 
We're not rebelling against society in sin. We're not rebelling against our enemy in sin. We are rebelling against the God who laid down His life for us. Amen. That's meant to prick the heart. Talking about that first love, that takes you back to Calvary, doesn't it? The rebuke of God ought to be fearful. He said, I have somewhat against thee. Boy, you start talking about God being against somebody, and that's a fearful thing. I mean, I've read the stories in this old Bible where somebody or some, some people group stood across the ring, if you will, from the Lord. And I tell you, that don't ever end up good. Uh, that, that don't ever come out on the upper hand on that thing. Even those who seem to stand before God or against God, they seem to be so courageous at the time, but yet it never ends up good. It never ends up with them victorious. We pray for those that stand against God. I'm talking about those in our friends and our family members that have taken a stand against God. And they seem to be courageous, but we know how fearful it is because we're praying that God would do something to get a hold of them. And we start thinking about what it could entail if God, if God has to get a hold of them, what is He going to have to do to break their pride? Jacob decided to wrestle God one night. He lived for the rest of his life. What's God going to do? It ought to be a fearful thing whenever the Bible says, God says, I've got something against you. It ought to jog our memory. He tells them, and he says in verse number 5, Remember therefore from whence thou art born. The rebuke of God ought to jog our memory. It ought to jog our memory and remind us where we were when Jesus found us as individuals. We were lost in our sin, but also where Jesus, where God found us as a church. Do you understand, speaking of the Highland Baptist Church, where we were uh, prior to 1903, we had split off of another church. We, had, we didn't have a home church. I, I'm talking about our people. That, that we were homeless orphans, you might say, as far as churches go, uh, before God. But God in His grace sent along another preacher and God put together another church that we could worship in and learn and grow and serve. Remember what God has done. That's what He's saying. Remember from whence thou art fallen. First part of verse 5, we see the mercy of God. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works. The mercy of God shows up to us in the fact that He gives us, most often gives us the opportunity to repent. We get it wrong and we find that God is a God of second chances and third and fourth and fifth and sixth most of the time. And most often He gives us the opportunity to get it right. Sometimes we take a prideful attitude with God. I just, don't, I just feel like God's trying to get me to do something that I don't want to do. Listen, He's given you an opportunity to get on His side. He's given us the opportunity to get it right. The opportunity to repent, it's not, it, it's not, a, it's not a, an oppression of God, it's an opportunity. He gives us the opportunity to repent, and He gives us the opportunity most often to get back in the race. He says here, He says here in verse number 5, Repent and do the first works. Get back in the race. It would be false for me to tell you that that's always the case. Sometimes sin completely alters God's plan for the individual believer and sin can alter God's plan for a church. Uh, completely alter it. 
But I want you to think about this. How often do we mess up? How many times do we mess up and God lets us just pick right back up where we left off and keep going? That's mercy. That's the long-suffering mercy of God. At the end of verse 5, we find the warning. Or else, or else, repent or else, I will come to thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of thy place, out of his place, except thou repent. Repent, or I will come quickly. By the way, he's not talking about the rapture right there. He's not talking about, you know, straighten up, or I'm going to come and call you all out of here, and that's going to be the end of it. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the visitation of God with a chastening rod. He's talking about the fact that God can move into a church and He can tear apart that congregation. God can come into a church in a, in a, in a way that, that Sunday school classes are disbanded and dispersed or that youth group that that church so, uh, so glorifies that He can disperse them. He says, and remove thy candlestick. In other words, I'll shut you down. I'll shut it down. He could dispense the whole church and shut the whole church down, but I want you to think about something else. He could allow the people to continue to meet there and simply leave us without His presence or power of the Holy Ghost. The Old Testament used a name. That name was Ichabod. It's in the Old Testament. It's a name that a lady gave to her kid, uh, to, her, to her baby, because uh, she named him Ichabod. It said because the glory had departed because the ark had been taken from Israel. The ark of God had been removed from Israel, so she named him Ichabod. The glory has <laughs> departed. <coughs> God can ride Ichabod over a church. <coughs> Remove their candlestick. The glory has departed. Let me, let me say it like this. If the glory of God does not abide in a church, what's the point? What's the point of going? These are strong words to a church at Ephesus. Strong words indirectly to us as a church. Strong words from God to His church. Get back to your first love. Do the first works. Your first love. Your first love in the church is not politics. Even though we're passionate about that, and that's fine. Uh, but that's not our first love. The first love is not money. Uh, we were a church before we had any. Somebody say amen. The first love is not numbers, numbers on the on, on, on the financial report or numbers on the on the year end report of attendance. That is not our first love. I think numbers are important, but that's not the most important thing here. What is our first love? God and His gospel and His word Amen. and His commission. Amen. Let's stand. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for allowing us to be in your house today, Lord. We thank you for the good day that we've had. It's good to be in God's house. Lord, we thank you for what we've seen you do in our midst this morning. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for the fact that, that, uh, that your presence is real in this church. We, we just ask that you to help us to, to uh, keep on in a way that would be honoring and glorifying to you. Lord, we repent of anything we're doing that's not right. We turn to you and ask, ask you to help us to, to keep things right at the Highland Baptist Church. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Amen.
game. <laughs>